Hello and welcome. I'm Charlie, and as you can see, I'm a giant tortoise. My home is a small but unique group of islands in the Pacific, a thousand kilometers west of South America. People find the islands fascinating, but at the same time somewhat uncanny, sometimes even unreal, due to their volcanic origin, which you would think would make them uninhabitable, but in fact they're teeming with life. The Galapagos Islands. Despite the seemingly inhospitable living conditions, you'll find life everywhere, because we have learned to adapt to these conditions. I'd like to introduce you to some of the most interesting creatures who live on the Galapagos Islands. For instance, the Galapagos sea lion. Yes, yes, we'll come back to you later. We don't want to disturb your snooze. This is the famous Galapagos land iguana. And here, it's even more special relation, the marine iguana. The very colorful red, red rock crab. And the white tip reef sharks. But the islands don't just consist of rock and lava. Thanks to the rainy season, numerous plants thrive here, providing a habitat for other creatures. For example, the brown pelican. And even flamingos feel at home here. The Spanish, who, incidentally, by chance, discovered the islands in 1535, named them after me, obviously because I impressed them so much. After all, I am a fine specimen. But first, let me tell you more about the remarkable reptiles on this group of islands. Here we see a prickly pear cacti growing in crevices in the lava. They provide food for the yellow land iguana. Its appearance is a little unusual, shall we say, due to the countless spiky crests on its head, which make it look rather like a geode turned inside out. The fact that the female land iguana uses the hot volcanic sand to hatch the clutch of three to 12 eggs she has laid is the reason why land iguanas are mainly found on Fernandina. It's the most westerly and youngest island of the archipelago. It lies directly above the volcanic hotspot which was responsible for the creation of the group of islands. Because the 13 main islands of the archipelago have widely differing characteristics and diverse living conditions, some species have developed subspecies on the different islands. That's why, apart from the ordinary land iguana, you'll also find the Santa Fe iguana, which has an even stronger yellow coloring and a more spiky appearance. And then there's the Rosada iguana, which has a distinct pink shade.
The male land iguana marks his territory by sitting on a rock in full view of everyone. That's his way of guarding the hole he has dug with his partner for her to lay her eggs. This is a relation of the land iguana, the marine iguana. The marine iguana is only to be found on the Galapagos Islands and is the only extant marine iguana species. It prefers to live along the coastline because that's where it finds its food. It feeds mainly on algae and seaweed. The excess salt it takes in when feeding is excreted through special salt glands in its nostrils. Marine iguanas are cold-blooded creatures. That's why they can only stay in cold seawater for approximately 10 minutes. They are, however, outstanding swimmers and are able to dive to depths of up to nine meters. Once they're out of the water, thanks to their dark skin, the sun quickly warms their bodies up again. scuffles amongst the marine iguanas to mark their territory are quite common. The main problem for them is the Galapagos hawk. Marine iguanas are the prey of choice when the hawk is feeding its young. And that just happens to coincide with the time when the marine iguanas retire inland to lay their eggs, making them an easy prey for the hawks. On the lava beach, the hawks have little chance of catching the iguanas, 
as they can easily camouflage themselves. Due to their grey skin and dragon-like appearance, they're hard to distinguish amongst the rocks. islands are home to seven endemic types of iguana. The males are larger than the females and can reach up to 30 centimeters, approximately 12 inches in length. Iguanas mainly eat flies, scorpions and other insects. They have a symbiotic relationship with the sea lions because they free them of bothersome flies. impressive, wasn't it? But you can find even more colourful creatures on the Galapagos Islands. These rugged cliffs, for instance, are the habitat of the red red rock crab. This agile and inquisitive crab prefers to be in the surf, but doesn't like splashing water. Its main source of food is algae, which it gnaws off rocks, together with other marine organisms. But also the odd carcass which gets washed ashore is a welcome extra in its diet. Red rock crab is extremely agile and can move in any direction extremely quickly, which means it can easily escape an attack by seabirds and conceal itself between the rocky crags. Its curiosity, however, will soon get the better of it and it'll surface again fairly quickly. crabs have a black colouring, while more mature crabs have a brownish or reddish colouring. Bless you. Probably the food was a little too salty. Ah, there we have a friend who is spending his winter holidays with us the black stone turner. He's flown an amazingly long way from the northern parts of America. The red rock crab doesn't cover such long distances, despite the fact that it's a fast mover, but it can jump.
The name Red Rock Crab doesn't mean that nature has decided that all the crabs must be this color. For instance, there are also yellow, pink, and white examples. And this black one is perfectly camouflaged on the lava rocks. So, not everything is grey and bleak on my group of islands. There's so much more. There's one sociable and playful species that adds a great deal to life on the islands, and I'd like to introduce them to you now. Galapagos sea lions. You'll find them on virtually all the islands of the archipelago, just like their smaller relations, the Galapagos fur seals. Although they enjoy spending most of their time in water, you can frequently find them on land. To protect themselves against too much sun, they seek out the shade in natural caves or under cliffs. They cool down in tidal pools or in the sea. One of the favorite spots of the Galapagos sea lion is the leeward northern shore of the oldest and most southerly island, Española. Here's a female with her pup. The relationship between the two is extremely close. Not surprising after a gestation period of 12 months. And she will continue to breastfeed it for another few months. A sea lion pup only becomes fully independent after three to four years. That's how long it takes for the females to reach sexual maturity. Males only reach sexual maturity after seven or eight years and then have to fight fiercely for their own territory. 
This also makes them more aggressive and short-tempered than the more playful females. It's not surprising that male sea lions are constantly fighting for their territory and trying to find a mate, because there are far fewer of them. A male sea lion will often have as many as 30 females in his harem. Sea lions don't always have beautiful, dense, dark brown fur. Pups only lose their baby fur after about four months. Initially, they also can't swim. They learn to swim, together with other pups, in calm bays. Only when they can swim properly do they follow their mothers out to sea. The young animals play with one another while their mothers hunt for fish. They won't hunt for food on their own until they're a couple of years old. Male sea lions can weigh up to 250 kilograms, females roughly 100 kilograms. There are between 20 and 50,000 of them on the Galapagos Islands. The reason for the huge difference in numbers is partly due to a weather phenomenon, El Nino. It occurs in irregular cycles and in different degrees of severity. The results, however, can occasionally be disastrous.
the arrival of El Nino signals a decrease in the cold Humboldt current, which can even cease completely. The temperature of the seawater rises, causing plankton and small fish to die. This disrupts the food chain, because seabirds and fish can't find sufficient food. Their only chance is to leave the area if they want to escape their sad fate. The situation can prove fatal for seals, as they no longer find any food and many starve to death. Before I introduce you to my family and a couple of other Galapagos inhabitants, let me show you the islands in a little more detail. Life on the Galapagos Islands is not always easy. During the first half of the year, there are only three or four months at the most in which any rain falls, which is why there is a constant shortage of fresh water. The arid countryside often looks desolate. Lava rock, steppe and cacti dominate the scene. The Galapagos Islands are of volcanic origin. They're the tips of a huge range of volcanoes, a hot spot which is still active. Six volcanoes erupt on a regular basis. The archipelago is the region with the world's greatest volcanic activity. And there is another special feature. The islands shift. They're located on a tectonic plate which covers a magma chamber. They move from west to east as if on a conveyor belt. That's why Fernandina in the west is the youngest island and Española in the east is the oldest. Once the rainy season starts, the islands burst into life. Most of the flowers are a shade of yellow, because there is only one type of bee on the islands which is responsible for pollination, the Galapagos wood bee. Most likely, the flowers have adapted themselves to its preferred color.
These are prickly pear cacti. They are propagated by the Galapagos rat, which feeds on their seeds. The hard shell of the seeds is crushed during digestion, and after being excreted, the seeds start to germinate. These extremely hardy plants store nutrients that provide food for other creatures. The iguanas certainly have no fear of their thorns, and also for my fellow tortoises, they provide a welcome change to grass. Apart from the 13 main islands, there are hundreds of small islands and outcrops. Some of them are several hundred meters high and provide breeding grounds for the numerous seabirds. The Galapagos Islands were made famous by Charles Darwin, who discovered certain aspects of life here that formed the basis for what was to become his theory of evolution. During his worldwide voyage, he visited four of the islands in 1835. He was fascinated by the diversity of life on the seemingly uninhabitable islands. He also found that there were tortoises on the island which had slight variations in the shape of their shells. He noted, too, that there were various types of mockingbirds on the different islands. The term adaptive radiation goes back to Darwin. It means that a species which in itself is not highly specialized can, by adapting itself to the ecological conditions around it, become a highly specialized species. That also involves using diverse, previously unused ecological niches. Or, to put it another way, my fellow species, and many other creatures, have adapted to the special conditions pertaining on the island on which they found themselves 
and, in the process, mutated into a new species. A gathering of white tip reef sharks. They can be recognized easily by their white tipped dorsal fin and tail. At the moment, they're resting after hunting for fish, crustacea, and cephalopods. Come nighttime, they'll become active again. This is my family. We giant tortoises are the largest of our fellow species living in the world today. We can weigh up to 300 kilograms and live for up to 150 years. Some of my relations don't have a dome-shaped shell, but rather a more saddle-shaped one. The front end is bowed upwards. That's particularly useful when you need to raise your head up to reach taller plants. Most of my relations on the eastern islands have saddle-shaped shells because the plants there grow considerably higher. Like the iguanas, we giant tortoises have concluded a pact with the small birds that live on our island. Finches and woodpeckers feed on the parasites and ticks on our skin. To let them know that we need their services, we stretch out and lie quietly until the birds have pecked off all the insects. It keeps us clean and makes life a little more comfortable. Our diet consists of grass, herbs, climbing plants, and berries. If our shells allow it, and we can stretch far enough, we also enjoy the juicy fruit of the prickly pear cacti.
Incidentally, our bodies are so large because they also act as a reservoir. We can store enough fat to last a year without food. And we can even manage without water for several months. We're very frugal. On this archipelago, that's sometimes an absolute necessity. With the possibility of a volcanic eruption at any time, or if El Nino returns, it's a good idea to have a little in reserve. my family. They're nice, aren't they? Finally, I'd like to introduce you to some feathered inhabitants of the islands. They're as colorful as they are talkative. Roughly 500 flamingos which live on the Galapagos Islands are immigrants from the Caribbean. You also wouldn't really expect to find ducks on the islands. But there are several thousand white-cheeked pintails here, and they feel just as at home as the flamingos. Lava heron is just one member of the heron family that has made its home here. They feed off the plentiful supply of fish, just like the brown pelicans, one of which is just cleaning his plumage.
Galapagos albatross is the largest bird on the islands, with a wingspan of two meters. Some 12,000 couples breed on Española, virtually the whole world population. Here we have the pirates amongst the birds, a female frigate bird. Frigate birds attack other birds and try to snatch away their food. The male frigate birds are famous for their mating habits. To impress the females, they blow up their red throat pouch. Someone else who appreciates the cold waters of the Humboldt and Cromwell currents is the Galapagos penguin. Due to various environmental influences, such as El Nino, as well as numerous natural enemies, like the sea lions and Galapagos hawk, they are now an endangered species. Standing 1 meter 20 tall, the great blue heron is one of the largest herons in North America. However, it's just as much at home in Central America as it is here. Stalking the beach on the lookout for fishes, crabs, or algae is a dusky gull. With just 300 to 400 couples, it's one of the smallest gull species in the world and endemic to the islands. I hope you enjoyed our little excursion around my homeland. Time for me to be getting back to my family. And time to thank you for your visit and 
to say goodbye.